I wanted to um, thank Salve Bank for sponsoring this. Uh, we initially had a sponsor and it was just going to be a seminar for our members, um, but then uh, we formed a little coalition group to try to share things with one another, especially through Zoom, uh, to just bring better benefits to our members through these um, hard times. And we hope everyone is safe and healthy. And here at GSA, our staff is all here today, as I said, having our first ever time together, uh, six feet apart with mask, and then um, had a little lunch and a jam session. So it was really nice to see everyone. It's been a long time. So um, I want to introduce Linda. Linda is um, a well-known figure in our industry. Linda has been past president of the New York State Association of Realtors. So uh, she's been uh, well-versed in all leadership areas. She's also a broker in the Long Island area and belongs to that board of realtors, which has been going through lots of really cool changes and growth. Um, and um, as I said, she is a past president and she's here today to talk to us about cultural sensitivity. And it's really important in these times, especially with what we're um, looking at with our uh, with the climate and culture. And I've, I've taken this seminar before, of course, not from Linda. And it's so interesting that I wanted to bring it to our members. So Linda, thank you for coming and being here for us. And I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Lenore. And again, thank you for having me. And it's great to see many of you here today. And I hope, and like Lenore says, I hope you are all safe and healthy. I'm down on Long Island. And as you probably know, we, you know, we are coming up right behind you. And as, as you go into a phase, we're probably about weeks behind you with things happening. Uh, so I'm excited to bring this topic today. When they asked me to speak about cultural sensitivity, cultural diversity, um, I, it makes my, my brain starts going into many, many different directions. So just to be clear, this is not a fair housing type seminar. We're not gonna be going through the protected classes of fair housing, but it's more of you having an understanding of the different cultures out there and how you can work with different cultures in your market and have an understanding of what they perceive things to be. Uh, I am also a, uh, a, an instructor, a, a certified international property specialist instructor. So I was bringing, bringing a lot of that information to the table as well. So I'm gonna uh, provide you with reference tools today. And I already put on, in the chat box a copy of the PowerPoint presentation, which you're welcome to reference back to. Um, this topic, really, we could speak for hours upon, uh, but we only have an hour and a half. So I kind of I cond condensed it all down, but any uh, questions you have along the way, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask me, as opposed to putting it in the chat. Uh, I think it's important that we have, have dialogue with this. So I'm gonna bring up the PowerPoint. Is that in the chat, Linda? The I, put it, I put it in the chat as a student handout. Okay. Uh, I put it earlier on. If, uh, if you don't see it, uh, if somebody could just remind me at the end, I'll, I'll put it back out there. Yeah, I don't think we, we're seeing it. Okay. I'll make sure. Actually, do you want me to go in and do it again or wait till the end? We can wait till the end. Okay, that's fine. So please just remind me, old brain, <laughs> you never know. Um, so, Again, the PowerPoint is available and I'll put it in the chat. And if you can't pull it off the chat, uh, I, you can email me and I'll, I'll send it off to you because I think the material is important more than anything, anything else. And like I said, this material is condensed. So we're going to keep this moving at a nice pace, but any questions, just jump on in. So again, we're talking about cultural awareness, sensitivity, diversity. Uh, that, that is really the keys here. And I think when we start talking about uh, cultural awareness and sensitivity, we have to look within ourselves first and start with our own real estate markets. So um, this is some interesting information. The United States Census Bureau projects by the year 2043 that the white is no longer white or not going to be the majority anymore. So we do need to, it sounds like it's so far away, but it really isn't that far away. Uh, and cultures are changing. Uh, I'm on Long Island. We are in a very culturally diverse area. Uh, different parts of the state are not as culturally diverse, but you really need to know this information because you never know where the next buyer or seller is coming from in terms of their background. 
Um, so the first thing you have to do with looking at your cultural uh, sensitivity and awareness is looking at your local markets. Uh, you want to know it within your market where are the different cultures? Are where are they in your market? Are they not inside your market? Uh, so where are these buyers sellers coming from? Uh, what language do they speak at home? When they're not out in public, are they speaking a different language at home other than English? Uh, what are they buying out there? And we're going to touch upon also sellers. You may have sellers in your market looking to retire and do not want to stay here in the United States. They may want to retire to other countries. So having this awareness uh, is very important because it's going to help you with your current situations, which you could run into. And where are we going to find all this information? So I'm going to bring up a couple of slides. The first couple of slides really are stats to give you a, a better awareness of what your market looks like. Uh, where I pulled this information is the United States Census Bureau. And also, if you go to this website, it's called datausa.io slash profile slash geo slash, now I put Cayuga in there, but it could be any county, but then dash county dash NY. I'll make sure you get this information. Uh, again, it's in the PowerPoint itself. You can go and put in any county within New York State and pull up all the demographics. Uh, I focused in on cultural here today and ethnicity, but it has a wealth of information on your local markets. And if you're going to be dealing with different cultures within your market, the first thing they want to know people moving in is what are, what's going on in your market. So for the benefit of the Greater Syracuse Association of Realtors, I put up these slides specifically for some of the markets there. If your county is not here, please do not take offense because uh, we have 63 counties, I believe, 62, 63 counties in New York State and we're not going to cover all of them. Uh, but just some background information to begin with, uh, which is New York State driven. Um, within New York State, the three top countries represented in New York State, number one is Dominican Republic, number two is China, and number three is Mexico. So throughout the state of New York, uh, non US citizens coming in are predominantly from Dominican Republic, China, and Mexico. Now, uh, this is back to 2018 data. And again, this is all coming from the US Census Bureau. Uh, so I broke it down a little further by counties. So with Onondaga County, uh, which is a population of 462,000 people, uh, 96, a little over 96% are US citizens and the rest are not. And of who, the residents here, 7.63% were born outside of the United States. And if I go through too fast for these, please slow me down, uh, but I want to get the stats through. So that's, that's one county. Uh, Cortland has 99.3% are U.S. citizens, and one point, so just shy of 2% were born outside of the United States. Uh, Cayuga, County, 99% uh, are citizens, and uh, just over 2% were born outside of this country. Uh, Madison County, 99% are citizens, 2.43 were born outside of the country. So this is information, why am I going through this with you? Because it's important to know, I think a lot of times what I'm finding in my market is the local realtors do not take the time to analyze the cultures within their own market. I can tell you that if I looked at Nassau County, Suffolk County, and Queens, which I have done, these numbers are completely different. So what I have found doing the research for today was we're, we're close to 99% uh, throughout the area are US citizens. And then you do have a small percentage of people that were born outside of the United States. Uh, Oneida County is probably was the lowest percentage at 96.4% US citizens and almost you know, a little over 7.5% were born outside of the United States. So by having these stats uh, really is going to help you with recognizing where people are coming from. 
Um, and here is Oswego, which is again 99% and 1.85. So this is the counties in Hocal. And again, I apologize to my Buffalo folks. I apologize if you're not within these counties, but again, you can easily pull up this information. Um, when it comes to the heritage, uh, the foreign born population, we already went through the numbers, but here's a graphic. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it. I can see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Um, so Onondaga is just under the 8%. It pulls in Syracuse separately uh, as 6% and then the, the other counties are down around the 2% mark. Uh, again, the citizenship, oh, whoop, now I did it. Uh, sorry about that, give me one second. Technical glitch. Hmm. You're seeing all the slides on the screen, correct? I don't know how that happened. Okay, we're back. My apologies. So moving on to uh, race and ethnicity, uh, we are also covering these by the, by, by the counties. And I'm just gonna go through these quickly, but as you can see, if you're looking at the race and ethnicity, um, this is Onondaga, uh, the, the orange color is white and then it breaks down from there. So I, I, my looking at the counties that I covered, you're mostly white, non-Hispanic, and then there's some white Hispanic in the area. But that does not mean we can't be dealing with other cultures here. And again, we have uh, buyers moving into the area, sellers moving out of the area, or maybe going into other countries. But it was interesting to look at the stats. This is um, Oneida. Again, uh, we have a large percentage of white, and then it breaks down much smaller. So it's good to know uh, what the, the main races and ethnicities are in your areas, because then you'll recognize where you need to put your focus. And, and some of the things I may talk about today, you may feel uncomfortable with, um, but this has nothing to do with being uncomfortable. It's really having the knowledge and recognizing your marketplace. So in 2019, National Association of Realtors, now this is throughout the United States, we had foreign purchasers purchase $77.9 billion worth of real estate. And the, mo the main place where they came from was China, Canada, India, the United Kingdom, and Mexico. So we do recognize these stats are all pre-COVID-19. You know, we're living in unprecedented times right now, but everything that I'm showing you is of course, all pre-COVID. Once NAR pulls their stats together for 2020, it should be very interesting to see what's going to happen with these numbers. But I don't think it's gonna veer off tremendously. The, the purchase amount may come down, but I really think we're going to see the same countries in, in pretty much the same order. Uh, what I'm showing you, this, um, this slide, uh, you can pull up this document at nar.realtor and you can just put in foreign, foreign buyer purchases and this is a slide that uh, you can pull up and you can print out. Uh, the other thing that usually National Association of Realtors charges for but is free now, so please try to take advantage of what's free and, and before you. National Association of Realtors every year puts out a profile of international transactions in the United States. So this is the 2019, this is just the snapshot of it. Uh, you go to the realtor store and it is zero dollars. Usually they're charging for these. So this is an interesting tool that really this slide came out of. So 
this makes you more aware of who's coming to this country, which cultures are coming into the country. So now that we have the stats out of the way, let's start getting into some of the nitty gritty. And again, if I'm going too fast, somebody tell me I'm going too fast, or you have questions, just please jump right in. So we, we will have what's called implicit bias. I don't know of anybody who does not have some type of bias. So an implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding actions and decisions in an unconscious manner. Uh, it exists when we unconsciously hold attitude towards others or associate stereotypes with them. So we do, we have these every, I don't know of a person who does not have it, but the most important thing is to understand and recognize the, our own biases that we have so we know how to deal with ourselves. Uh, I think with everything that's happening out there in the world, um, as you all know, I'm on Long Island. Uh, back in November, news they put out, not such a great thing for realtors on Long Island or anywhere in my opinion about those who were violating fair housing. I think may, many of the times and looked at a lot of the videos, a lot of it may have stemmed from some implicit bias, some of it was way out there in your face, but some of it could have been implicit. If you personally have an interest in knowing for yourselves, a self-analysis of looking at what biases you may have, I posted here a website, it's implicit.harvard.edu. So Harvard, Harvard University has put together tests and there's different tests that you can take, uh, white, versus black, um, skin color. Uh, it can come down to political views. There's so many different tests that you can take. They do not record them. They do not uh, share it with anybody. You can go in and, and at the end of the test, it tells you if you have a bias leaning one way or another. I have taken a number of them because I, I don't practice unless I preach it. Uh, so, uh, you know, so here I am saying, I recommend this, go in, you can look at your own biases because you may not know that you have these things and it could be reflected in your day-to-day -day real estate careers. So broadly, uh, race refers to physical or biological differences while ethnicity refers to shared cultural traditions like language, religion, and beliefs. So we are going to stay away from the more race part of it and what the focus is going to be is more the cultural end, cultural traditions, languages, religions, beliefs of what our buyers and sellers may believe in that's going to affect how they, their buying power in purchasing real estate. So the key to building inclusive cross-cultural relationships is to learn one's own attitudes towards these differences. We've got to recognize that our own personal biases and make sure that we can um, make sure they don't interfere with building relationships uh, because sometimes our, our own biases will turn off a, a buyer or seller and you don't even know uh, that you have turned them off. So what I'm going to be teaching here today is how to understand and give you the resources that you know to understand different cultures. And if you're going to be working with somebody from a certain culture, what I always do is I research that culture before I meet up with them. So I am going in firsthand knowledge of how they're going to, um, how they perceive things before I am working with them. And it's not about a stereotype. I'm not stereotyping them. I'm not putting them into one large bowl, but if I have some background information on what certain cultures are doing before I work with them, it will give me a heads up on how I need to react with them. Okay, so this is not about changing other people. This may be changing ourselves to work with them. Uh, so the National Association of Realtors, here's another uh, great video. It's about a 53, 54 minute video that I highly recommend that everyone look at it's that again it's on their website it is called bias override uh, overcoming barriers to fair housing video so it touches a lot on cultures and different biases 
So I highly recommend, I sat through this, it, it was eye-opening. I believe that we can all learn something new every day and this, this was a great video that I highly recommend. So moving on, uh, we're gonna talk about multi, multiculturalism. So this is the practice of acknowledging and respecting several different cultures, religions, races, ethnicities, and attitudes within a society. Uh, culture refers to a traditional common body of behavior and the values shared or recognized as typical of the majority of a given population. Uh, these behaviors and values characterize and distinguish people from one group from those of another. So just as an example, uh, if I have a client who's coming in and they're from Italy versus someone who's coming in from China, I will guarantee you that they have different cultures, they have different uh, religious backgrounds possibly, and they look at things completely different. Mm -hmm. So I will never lump everyone who's coming into the United States, or if I'm working with different cultures, you can't lump them all together. You have to recognize them for what they, what they believe in. So culture definitely impacts what we think, what we feel, how we view the world. Uh, so in order to acknowledge looking into this further and acknowledging that we might stereotype one another culturally, we need to recognize these different aspects. And again, this is hopefully a little bit more of self-awareness than anything, anything else out there. So here are some national statistics also. Um, so real estate market is changing. We, I think we know this uh, because of increasing cultural interaction among nations, regions, communities, and neighborhoods. It will definitely be interesting to see once we get through this pandemic and hopefully <laughs> we don't know when it's going to happen, but hopefully when we come out of this on the other side, it will definitely be interesting to see what countries what are out there that still want to make the purchase in here in the United States. Um, and over time, things have grown with technology and communications, social media, we have such great access to different cultures at any point in time. Uh, we all, I'm sure, are on social media. Just as a side note, uh, I've taken several trade missions with the New York State Association of Realtors, always to Italy, because that is who we are linked to. And I have made numerous friends with real estate professionals who are in Italy. Mm -hmm. and, dur and during this time of the pandemic, it has been very, um, interesting and upsetting at times to see what uh, our fellow real estate professionals were going through in Italy, because as you will know, they, they had got hit very hard. So everything is a learning experience. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in, in time with our, with, throughout our country. So real estate professionals, if you're interested in broadening your understanding of diversity, expanding your market share, these are things you have to think about. Um, you wanna build and expand your understanding of cultural differences to serve your clients better and, and fairly. Um, learn how to offer appropriate services. Um, understand and enjoy other cultures to build relationships. Uh, this is definitely a prerequisite for working with most international or immigrant or immigrant clients and understand and appreciate other cultures through open lines of communications. Uh, I have sent many of a New Yorker from Long Island who wants to retire uh, to, to different countries there and having the knowledge of certain countries like Mexico, Costa Rica, uh, Panama, where, where a lot of, of our uh, retirees sometimes want to go, has helped. So you may look at this information and say, well, how am I going to use this in my market? I don't have people moving here from China. But you I always say, think outside the box and think of your sellers who may not want to retire in the United States because it may be mm. cheaper, cheaper to retire elsewhere. So when we talk about this, it's not necessarily about buyers. It could also be about our sellers. And you always want to do the research before interacting with people from a different culture. Uh, if you don't have the research, you can make mistakes without even realizing 
that you've made mistakes. And I'm going to go through a lot of the mistakes that we could do culturally. Uh, we have a lot of do's and don'ts. So working the culturally with a diverse client here in New York. So the first thing we want to understand is have an understanding that depends on where they are coming from, or even if they are US citizens, they may still have built in cultures from their home country. So this really has nothing to do with just the country they're coming from, but it could be their family beliefs still. So I have, uh, for example, I have some clients who are, are Chinese, they are third generation Chinese, but they still follow the cultures from their parents and grandparents. So it has not, does not necessarily mean that they are coming here uh, firsthand from China. They could be in our society already, already, but they look at things definitely culturally the same as if they were from a different country. So we look at, when, I, when we look at cultures, there's two different types of cultures out there. We have our high context cultures and our low context cultures. So an example of a high context culture is from Asia Pacific, Russia, Middle East, Central, South America, Southern Europe, Africa. These cultures typically tend to be um, about saving face. They're, they will want to build a relationship first. So their cultures say, we're not going to work with you unless we trust you. If we trust you, then I will buy a property from you, but this is going to be a process. So anyone coming from these cultures typically want to build that relationship first. They also look at a contract as being the beginning of the process, not the end of the process. So as a real estate professional in New York State, I think we all look at it as a contract as being we put, uh, finally, we, we found the house, we put the deal in, everybody signed the contract, we are in contract now, Every all the terms are agreed upon. However, if you're working with someone from one of these cultures, what you may find and what may frustrate you is that that contract to them is just the beginning of the negotiation. So it would not be uncommon for someone from one of these countries or these cultures to come back after a contract is signed and say they'd like to renegotiate something. So being, again, a New Yorker, uh, um, I think our first reaction is, you can't change that, you're in contract. Uh, so, but if we have an understanding that these things could happen from these people from these cultures, if it comes to you, your first reaction is not gonna be no, right? Your first reaction usually to me is like, no, but if they come to you, you, you have to take a step back and see what it is they want to change and see if that is a possibility to do. So that's our high context people. Our low context cultures are more informal, direct communication. They want fast paced results and they want punctuality. So if you have an appointment with them at 10 a.m., they're going to be there at 10 a.m. and they expect you to be um, on time yourself and they expect you to have everything organized and when they sign that contract of sale they say we know it's a deal and that that is it so that's typically of the united states canada northern europe australia new zealand and south africa because south africa is tied more to the uk than anything else so and so those are the people that are on time our high just going back to our high context people a high context people, if you have an appointment with them for 10 a.m., you need to be there at 10 a.m. They will show up 11 a.m., 11.30, and still think they are on time. So again, from a cultural standpoint, if, you're, if you know ahead of time that someone from a high context culture is coming, you may want to figure out differently how you want to make your appointments. So instead of sitting there and being frustrated that they're not showing up, if you know ahead of time that they're going to be delayed because this is not unusual, you'll have a better idea of how to work with them and then you will get frustrated and your frustration will come out on that. 
So that's just an overview on cultures. And it's not, again, we're not stereotyping, it's just having an understanding. What's also important dealing with cultures is our nonverbal signals. This makes up 80 to 90% of what we are doing on a daily basis. Our eye movements, our facial expressions, hand, leg, and body gestures, uh, the way we are, our, our posture, the way we hold ourselves, uh, use of physical distance and touching and the tone of voice is all very important for who we are working with. There are some cultures that expect us, our, our low cultures expect us to have direct eye contact. Our high context cultures do not want us staring them down. If I sit here and just stare at the camera all day, it's going to make them very uncomfortable. So they, a lot of you just have to watch your own, your stature, your facial expressions. I'm going to give you some examples as we go through here. Uh, but if you, again, have some understanding on who you're dealing with, then you're going to know uh, how to work with them. So cultural variations. So here are some things that I just pulled as examples for you. Uh, the number four, uh, to the Chinese and Koreans, the number four means death. So a Chinese buyer, a Korean buyer will most likely not purchase any property that has the number four in it. In fact, I know of some homeowners uh, who were not Asian that changed the number, went to the post office and asked to change their house numbers because they wanted to list it for sale and uh, they wanted to get the numbers four out of there. So four is, means death. Uh, in, for the Koreans, three and seven are lucky numbers. So if you have properties, the more threes and sevens in them, the better. And with the Chinese, eight is very lucky. I was driving the other day and I passed the house and their number was 888. That's a very lucky house for my Chinese cultures. Uh, the other thing we want to recognize with different cultures is they have different um, ways of uh, doing things, different traditions. Uh, not all Asians do this, but uh, feng shui, and I, uh, feng shui is, is the, probably a two-day course. So there are certain cultures that believe in the influences of the location, the uh, yin and yang. Uh, everything has to be balanced. So besides having a home inspection with certain Asian cultures, they may also want to have their feng shui expert come in and analyze the property. Uh, and it, within the property itself, it's broken down into sectors. And there are things that can influence the, the sale. Uh, for example, if there is a tree right out your front door, uh, that tree blocks what's called the chi. And most likely uh, an Asian buyer who follows feng shui would never purchase that property. So uh, the, again, these are just some cultural variations and we're going to get into more. Uh, I, would, I would sit here all day and give you all the different cultural variations. But again, I think it's important to know that every culture has their own, uh, their own beliefs. Uh, what's important for us as real estate professionals is cross-cultural listening. You need to pay attention. Obviously, in our own day-to-day -day careers, the more we listen, the more we learn about people. But we not, need to pay attention to the person and the message and never assume to what the person wants. Uh, I'm a believer in open, asking open-ended questions. You don't want to ask questions that only require a yes or no answer. The reason behind this is that many cultures will say yes because they don't want to embarrass you. So no in many Asian cultures uh, is, is almost, it's, it's like they're going to embarrass you if they say no. So it's always best to ask questions that do not require a yes or no answer something that is open-ended that they can ask you. Um, because they're always going to say yes. Even if they don't, if you ask them, did you like that house? Even if they didn't like it, they're going to say yes, so they don't embarrass you. Um, it's important to 
emphasize and create rapport with rapport with people. Uh, with our high context cultures, it, they are expecting that. They're expecting you to understand that the relationship has to be built first. And if you don't understand something, uh, you, it's good to paraphrase. So if someone from a different culture says something to you and you don't understand it, instead of thinking you understand, it's okay to go back and paraphrase it back to them and say, so you're saying this is, you know, this information here. So if they tell you they want a certain house and then you can just say, well, okay, so my understanding is that you need a two family house with separate quarters for your parents. So it's always best if you don't understand completely to paraphrase the question back to them. Uh, request information in a way that does not bias or inhibit the other person's response. That's my open-ended questions. So you don't, if somebody says yes to you, does not mean yes. Any questions along the way? Okay, so cross-cultural business skills. Um, so how do you be sure, you gotta make sure your, uh, your behavior is appropriate. You always wanna have positive attitude and you need to adjust to the need for high or low context interactions. So again, if you know early on, whether they're high context or low context, you will know specifically how to interact with them. Uh, and you need to recognize the cultural considerations in business transactions. So here are the do's and don'ts. Uh, I'm gonna take these one at a time. Saving face, this is the most important, especially for our high context people. You, they do not wanna be embarrassed and they do not wanna embarrass you. So if um, you say something that could be embarrassing to them, uh, they're not going to want to work with you. And this is a little further on. You also do not want to self-deprecate yourself. I think sometimes we kid around with each other and I'll just say something silly about myself. Oh, look at me. I, I just messed that up. Um, like the PowerPoint. Um, I would never think of saving, saying that in front of a culturally different client because they are now seeing that they're gonna be embarrassed for me. Uh, talk less, listen more. I think that's true in everything that we do, but I think it's most important with our multicultural clients and know that that relationship has to come first. If we don't build that relationship, uh, you're going to end up losing the buyer or the seller. Uh, the formal slow pace is again with our high context cultures. We cannot rush people into things. Uh, what we need to do um, is recognize their cultures and how they do business so we can explain better to these people how business is done here. I, I think that a lot of times we make assumptions that people understand how we do business. Now, I can speak about this. I am downstate New York. You are all upstate New York. I believe you all do your own contracts. Downstate New York is backwards. We don't do contracts. So we, we put together the deal and then we hand it over to the attorney and the attorney drafts up the contract to sale, the sales attorney, and then we hope that in two weeks the deal goes into contract. Now, I know this sounds very foreign to you, but however, just think of how foreign it sounds to somebody who's from a different culture and doesn't understand how we do things. So anytime you're dealing with somebody who's from a different culture, from a different country, coming here to work, never assume that they understand how you do business. So I was asked once when we were in, in Italy, uh, I was asked uh, certain things on how we do business in the United States and my answer had to be, we do things differently state by state. So I, I narrowed it down to New York, but even within our own state, we do things differently. So have an understanding that um, the pace, you're gonna have to have a slow pace, especially in the beginning and explain everything to them. Punctuality applies to you. Even if they're going to be an hour, hour and a half late, you need to be on time. Attorneys, 
cult, different cultures look at attorneys differently than we look at attorneys. And so again, downstate New York, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, hopefully there's no attorneys here, there's nothing against attorneys, but we use attorneys. We, we use attorneys, they draft contracts, they review contracts upstate. Uh, we have title companies. Many cultures do not have uh, attorneys in their cultures, or if we mention the word attorney to them, they think there's a problem because in certain cultures, the attorneys are only brought in when there's a problem. Uh, contract, again, we discussed the beginning and the end. The high context, they look at that as the beginning, the low context, that is the end. We put everything together. And this last one here, there's a, we have some more, but this is really important. Uh, we tend to be an informal society here, uh, especially in New York State. People come, you call them by their first names. We need to recognize, but to be culturally aware that when you're meeting someone from another culture, you address them as Mr. or Mrs., Senora, Senorita, whatever the case may be, until they give you permission to address them differently. And many cultures, you have, they will defer to the elderly. Uh, in our Asian cultures, the uh, elders are very important in the decision making. So you may be taking out a, a, a um, as an example, you may have a Chinese buyer. You are taking them around to look at properties. Uh, let's say it's a husband and wife you're showing properties to. And now they want to come back and bring mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. They want to bring the entire family. This is not unusual. They will not make that decision until the elders have seen the property. And it's typically, in the Asian society, it is typically the elders that are the decision makers. So even though you may be taking around husband and wife who will be putting the title in their name, they are not necessarily the decision makers. And you may have to make numerous trips to a property to make sure that everyone in the family who needs to see it the property does see the property. Um, so again, respect for hierarchy. If you're doing, if I have any of my commercial practitioners out there, uh, if you are doing business with uh, uh, different cultures, you need to re respect the hierarchy of the uh, who is in charge there. The person that you are speaking to at first may not be the person that is going to be signing off on the documents. So if you understand the culture ahead of time, uh, you are going to understand how to do business there. Business etiquette, business card etiquette, I'm sorry, business cards. So here's the funny thing about business cards. We have, I've seen so many different array of business cards. Well, first of all, make sure your business card has the proper information on it according to New York State Department of State. Uh, but more importantly, not more importantly, uh, just as important is to make sure that you understand how different cultures accept different accept business cards. It is a ritual. It is a ritual in Asian cultures uh, to, I'm going to, actually, I'm going to see if I can just push this down. So I'm just going to stand up here for a moment. Um, so it is a ritual in many cultures, Asian cultures especially, to take a business card face up with it facing you. So this is not a business card, I only have one in front of me. So this is the top of my business card. If I am meeting with an Asian person, I'm going to stand away. I'm going to hand it to them. So my card is facing them that they can read with a slight bow and my eyes are down. They are going to do the same thing. It's two-handed. If we're dealing with Asian cultures, it is a two-handed business card. Always. Um, other times, one hand is fine, but I have gotten into the habit, even with non-Asian cultures, to give my business card with a slight bow. It's respectful. So the other side of this is to make sure that when someone gives you a business card, do not write on their business card. That is a big mistake. Never write on somebody's business card. They look at business cards as being, you know, this is you. So why would you take a business card and don't write on the back of your business card either. 
Don't take your business card and turn it over and add additional information. If you have additional information, give it to them on a separate piece of paper. So business cards are a ritual in many cultures. Also, do not take somebody's business card and just take it and put it away. You must get the business card, look at it, acknowledge it, say thank you, and then put it down in front of you. Don't stick it in your back pocket because now you're sitting on them. It becomes rude, right? So you don't put it in your back pocket. Don't just take it and put it into your wallet. Don't put it into your pocketbook. So with many cultures, so, and I think we can use this in our day to day. When I meet people today, although six feet distancing doesn't help with this. So if I'm gonna do someone with six feet distancing, I am still going to bow and present the card, but then I will leave it on the table for them to take. So I, I'm doing, still doing it, but we have to modify our rituals. So please recognize that with many cultures, this business card um, says a lot about you and you don't want to um, do anything to defame them or yourself. If you find yourself doing business with certain cultures, which maybe some of you are, uh, let's say you're dealing with Spanish speaking cultures, it's okay to have a business card, which one side of the business card is in English, the other side of the business card is in Spanish. When you do hand them the card, you can hand it to them with the Spanish side up. So these are just some recommendations, but we take business cards, I think for granted. I go to conventions all the time. A lot of times people take my business card and then start taking the picture of it so they can put it in, in, their, in their phone. That's fine, but don't do it until the people have left, right? You don't want to insult them in any way, shape, or form. Let me bring this back up. Uh, family matters. Uh, family matters are private. Please don't ask any questions that are, unless they offer you information. So again, from a fair housing perspective, obviously there's questions we can't ask, uh, but you don't want to start prying into different family ma matters at all. And even though you may understand that you're maybe dealing with a Chinese buyer, then the elders are gonna come, you don't wanna pry and start asking, getting a laundry list of the family. They will tell you who they want to come and when they want them to come. Uh, interpreters. So here's the thing about interp interpreters. It's fine to have an interpreter, but never assume upfront that somebody needs an interpreter. Uh, just because someone's from a different culture, their main language may not be English, but that does not mean that they don't understand English. So first, you don't want to insult them by automatically having an interpreter. Uh, it is okay to ask them if you feel that they're, maybe you're having trouble understanding, you can ask their permission if they would like an interpreter. And the third thing about interpreters is never, ever, ever let a somebody under the age of 18 interpret. Sometimes families may come and they have a young child who speaks perfect English and now starts interpreting for the adults. You do not want them, especially if it comes down to uh, contract issues, uh, uh, things that you want them to understand. You don't want an interpreter who's underage. So, but again, never assume that they don't speak English, but it's okay to ask them that they would prefer an interpreter. Um, software translations, be very careful about how things translate. I have some slides to show you this. Be things that we say in English do not always translate properly into other languages. So you've got to be careful and some of these online software translations don't work properly. So if you're not sure, it's best to have someone who can, can uh, translate documents for you as opposed to using something that's on, online, any type of software. Uh, you need to be aware of nonverbal signals. Uh, again, especially our high context cultures, they're not going to tell you that you're, you're wasting their time. You may line up six properties. They're in town for the day. You have six properties lined up for them and they are not liking any of them. They're not going to tell you. 
So just watch for nonverbal signals, uh, yawning, they start looking away, or they're very quiet. I find that with uh, many cultures, when they get quiet, that means they've lost complete interest. Uh, you may feel uncomfortable showing a property and now you have someone who speaks a different language that you don't understand and they're going through the house speaking with each other in that, that language. When there's a lot of conversation going on, that's a good thing. So you may feel uncomfortable because you don't understand. You don't know what they're saying. They could be talking about you for all you know. But once there's communicate, once there's communication between themselves, it is a very good sign. I, I can give you a quick example that just happened uh, right as we came into phase two here on Long Island. I had a, um, a, a Chinese man and woman wanted to see one of my properties. I brought them into the property and they were speaking the entire time amongst themselves, amongst themselves in Chinese, not a word to me. They said hello to me, they were, they were fine. I, they let me walk them through the house six feet apart from each other. However, they spoke to each other the entire time. I knew they were going to buy the house. We are in contract on the house. So if you can recognize these cultural differences these little innuendos, it's going to help you in your business. Uh, common sense, use your common sense. If you see that somebody's bored, it's okay to pull them aside and say, you know, I have, maybe these properties are not of interest to you. Let's have an open dialogue and see what, what is it that you would like to see. So instead of being negative on the ones you showed them, let's be positive on the ones you're going to look at. Uh, do not make jokes. If you do not, you don't know these people, uh, do not joke with them. Even if there's, um, it's not, I mean, I like to joke around with my clients, but it's only after I get to know them and I, and I make sure that there's no, uh, no offensive type of things, but I like to just have fun and it's okay to have fun, but don't tell any jokes. Don't joke around. Don't put yourself down. Uh, that's really important. Now, Avoid the dirty hand. Now, what you're probably saying, what the heck is the dirty hand? Uh, many cultures, the dirty hand is the left hand. So, uh, it's, so for my lefties out there, I apologize. Uh, they, they, many cultures, uh, there are a lot of cultures that eat with their hands. So you will always look that they will always be eating with their right hand. The left hand is dirty. So never do anything uh, with your left hand. If you need to guide them along the way, we're gonna talk about how you can guide people. Don't use your left hand. It's always with the right hand. So it's not all cultures, but what I say is it's not, it can't hurt to just use your right hand for everything. Any questions? Okay. I have a question. Uh, yes. Um, you said uh, about interpreters. Could you just back up to that for a minute? Sure. Is it appropriate to ask the um, buyers, let's say, if they want an interpreter? Um, and, yes. and I've had I've had buyers say, "Oh no, no, my son is here." When we get to the point where we're going to do a contract, then I'll bring someone else in that's old, older. And so I was like, "Eek." You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to be careful. Again, you want to be careful with minors. If if they're, you know, if you're showing the property, and uh, if the buyer has a good understanding of the English language, then you're probably not going to need interpreters. But at that point where now you're going to be moving into legal documents, yes, uh, then you definitely cannot use that gotcha. mi that minor child. Okay. Uh, it's it's also good to have. Uh, someone, if you have someone that you work with that speaks the language, you can reach out to them to jump in. Uh, again, I'm in an area that we deal with attorneys. So in, in many instances, we're pulling in an attorney that speaks their language because the contract is going to be in English 
and it's good to have someone there that can explain the legal language to them. So uh, if you can align yourself with some attorneys out there, even though you are, you're doing the contract, uh, with the contract review, you want an attorney that can read the written contract and explain it to them in their, in their language. Okay. Okay. So in that case, you, if they don't want an interpreter, then maybe the attorney could suggest an interpreter if they weren't understanding everything the attorney was trying to explain to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, or, or you may want to align yourself, uh, yeah. start thinking of attorneys that you work with that may speak different okay. languages in your, in your market area. All right. Thank I, you. I do that. I have, I have several attorneys that I work with. I have my base real estate attorneys, but when I'm dealing with an international client, I have other attorneys that I work with as well, because there's other things here too. I mean, we're just touching on the surface of culture, but there's other things that I have to take into account. Uh, one being um, 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 moving money. And, and this is, that's like a whole different course. You know, is if the money's not here and it's in a different currency, we've got to work with those things. So I have different attorneys that handle uh, my international clients. But good question. So here are some nonverbal red flags. These are things that you can be aware of when you're showing properties or sitting down with a seller who is you know, from a different culture. Um, if you go too close to them, now nobody can get close to anybody these days, um, but under normal circumstances, we're, we are used to sit, standing certain feet apart from each other and everybody has their comfort level. If you come close to somebody and they take a step back from a different culture, do not step forward to them. They're telling you that you're too close. So even though we may be comfortable with say a two to three foot differential when speaking with somebody, they may need that to be more of a four or five foot different. You know, so if, you, if you're too close and they take a step back, just don't, you start moving closer to them because you're just going to back them into a corner. Um, eye contact. Again, we don't want to stare people down, especially our high context purchasers or sellers. Uh, but if they're kind of looking away you know, like this, you know, that's telling me they're bored. If they're not looking at you or having some type of, they're not going to be staring at you, but if they start looking elsewhere, uh, they're not happy. You've got to make some changes. Scowling, frowning, <laughs> that's right there. You, you need to make some adjustments. Um, any type of inappropriate laughter, if somebody all of a sudden um, lets out a laugh, it, that's, a ner that's nervousness. And that is a signal to you that there is something wrong going on here. Um, so you're missing, missing something. So these are things to help you understand uh, other uh, people. Covering the face, if they start covering their face, uh, that also is a nonverbal uh, flag that's telling me that they're just, they're not happy. They're not happy. They're not happy with what I'm telling them. They're not happy with the situation. And I need to make some adjustments if I want to hold on to them. Uh, the remaining silent and no questions, absolutely. Uh, I, I know when somebody doesn't like something, if they're so quiet, I, if the example I gave you, if that Chinese couple had, um, went through that house and quiet the whole time, we would have been, I knew to get them out of there quickly. So if they're not asking questions, they remain silent. It's a red flag with many cultures. And if they're just displaying impatience. So as much as you may have an agenda to show so many properties and whisk them out the door, you have to be able to recognize these red flags and say, okay, something has gone wrong. I need to take a step back and reevaluate what's going on here. Uh, so here are some behaviors that we should avoid: hands in the pockets or hips. So don't put your hands on the pockets. That like that looks like, uh, you know, you're annoyed. Uh, don't have an intense, prolonged eye contact because if I do this, you're going to be uncomfortable. Um, scratching your head. Now you may have an itch, but scratching your head in some cultures means you're embarrassed or you're embarrassed by them. So try to avoid uh, touching your head, especially with COVID-19, right? Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, don't touch your face. Uh, crossing of your legs in certain cultures is offensive. 
uh, showing the soles of your feet. So if you're sitting back and speaking to somebody, uh, this is very true in um, a lot of Middle Eastern cultures, that is like cursing at them. Uh, so if you sit back and you put your feet are not flat on the ground, you put your foot up so they can see the sole of your foot, the sole of your shoe, hopefully you have shoes on, that is offensive to them. Uh, pointing, if you need to point, you don't point, you don't do this, you don't go pointing at things, you don't point to people. It's more common using your entire hand. If you want to guide them, you just use your hand and guide them. But don't point with your feet either. So don't just put your foot out and say, go this way, or go that way with your foot. Always with a uh, the palm open and guide the people um, away. Um, Fleeing or invading personal space against that personal space that they want. Just don't get too close to them. Uh, do not show impatience. Uh, it can be very frustrating if you don't understand certain cultures, like if they, if they show up late and you get, you've lost all your patience and now you are angry because they uh, came an hour late. Uh, so, you know, don't lose your patience. If you do your homework ahead of time and understand the different culture of the people that you're working with, then you're going to understand, okay, they're late according to New York time, but they're on time according to their culture. Again, no pointing. Um, and don't, don't do this, none of this, uh, come, come here type of thing. Nothing with fingers like this. That is very rude. And in some cultures, so what does this mean for us? What, is this, what does this mean here? Anybody? If I give the thumbs up. What do you think? It means okay, right? Great job, thumbs up. This is an obscenity in some cultures. So what interprets well here in the United States, you could have just, this is like giving the middle finger to us in other cultures. So beware of things to avoid there. Religion and faith. So part of cultural understanding is knowing where they're coming from, but also having an understanding of what possible religions are out there, or that they can be given from. Um, we understand that Christianity is the largest number of, here in the United States, 70.6% of Americans identify themselves as being Christian. But then if you start breaking it down, there are so many different denominations of Christianity. So having some understanding of different religious beliefs is also going to help you through the process. Um, so religious traditions, uh, it's fundamental to cultural identity norms and traditions. A lot of cultures don't just identify themselves as the country they're coming from, but their religious beliefs are ingrained in them and become part of cultural attitude. So it is very important to to learn the beliefs and traditions of the clients that you're going to be working on, but working with. Um, you do not have to change your beliefs and traditions. I have yet to meet a client that says, well, Lindy, you are, um, you're a Christian and, and I'm not, so I need you to change. I, I've never had a client say that to me, but if you have an understanding of their tradition, beliefs and traditions, it will help you because you know it, it influences their personal life, it influences their family life, and it influences their business habits and their business decisions. I have um, a question, Linda. Yes. Um, if you don't know their religious traditions, how can you ask it? Well, you're not, I'm going to, so you're not going to ask it because again, fair housing. So this is all about cultural understanding. And in just a minute, I'm going to give you an idea of how to do some cultural, okay. uh, find, about different cultures. Because even if they come from China, I still may not know their religion. Right. But I think it's important to know that many cultures, the re their religious beliefs will play into this. Um, there are some cultures that they will, they will tell you. There, some people will tell you uh, because, for example, Muslims, uh, they need to pray at certain times of the day. Uh, and they will tell you that they can't look at properties between certain hours. Or they can tell you, I can go out and look at properties, but I'm going to need to put some time aside 
where, wherever we're going and I'm going to need a place to pray. So you may have to, if they tell you outright uh, that they are Muslim um, and you are not Muslim, it's good to know what their traditions are so then you can respect that tradition. I, um, you may need to provide space in your office where they can go and lay out a mat and pray for 20 minutes, 15 minutes. So this is what it's about. It's not about asking them, but they may offer you the information. Hopefully that's helpful. Again, I'm not, we're not stepping over fair housing here and then we're not asking you to ask them. So here are some, uh, I was just mentioning this. So anyone who's coming from Asia Pacific, these are a list of different beliefs. Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity. Again, I will not know unless they tell me ahead of time. And they're only going to tell me if it has an impact on when they're going to go looking at properties. Uh, there are some religions, uh, Judaism, if they are, depending on, uh, there's many different areas of Judaism, but if they are Orthodox or Hasidim, they will not look at properties from sundown on uh, Friday until sundown on Saturday. So there is no way if I list the house with someone who is an Orthodox Jewish seller that they are going to allow me to do an open house on a Saturday. So if you know these things ahead of time and have an understanding and are sensitive to this, you would never even suggest to them an open house on a Saturday. And we have certain uh, beliefs where they do not want to do business on Sundays. So it's not about um, anything to do with fair housing. It has nothing to do with steering. It's how you have an understanding of what their beliefs are and how you can work with them with their cultural and religious beliefs. So hopefully that helps you there. Um, and let me, before I move on, there's, there's something else here that I want to point out, which is going to make um, the women here in the group uncomfortable. And I apologize, but we're here talking about cultural sensitivity. Um, there are some um, religions that the men will not work with women. They do not look as women uh, in their culture or in their religious beliefs as being business people. And when I teach the CIPS class, I go into this in more depth, but these are, so we are, we're in the United States of America. We have equal rights. Uh, some people coming to you to look for properties may have different beliefs and different ideas of equal rights. Uh, that is, I, what I'm saying is you do not have to work with people that you feel could be um, uh, against your beliefs. Now, nobody forces anybody to work with anybody. But the most important thing is you cannot change them. Uh, you cannot, if, if you feel okay with working with them, uh, I as a woman would, may have to make a decision, am I going to work with this person and bring on a male realtor to be there? Now again, uh, this has nothing, I'm, 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 a, I'm a United States citizen. I have my own beliefs, but I also have to understand these different cultures. I'm not going to change them. I'm not going to stand there on a soapbox and explain to them that they need to get up in, in the times with everything. Um, so again, I apologize if I'm making any of you feel uncomfortable. Uh, this is to talk about different cultures. We have to discuss the uncomfortableness. Uh, but again, we, the whole point of understanding the cultures is that we can adjust to them and not expect them to just to us. Um, and, and one, another thing just, uh, no, I uh, my email. Oh, uh, somebody, I think, my email, I, think my email <laughs> I think somebody is not muted there. Um, so with other cultures, uh, I'm using feng shui as an example. There's, there's different uh, faiths out there. There's people that believe in numerology, uh, feng shui is uh, not practiced by all Asians, but feng shui, uh, they believe, as uh, I said earlier, in yin and yang, and there's good and bad feng shui. So if we understand the cultures, uh, it's going to help you in, in 
business. So here is what I mentioned. Here is the book, Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands. I also have it live with me. Uh, this is the second one of these I have. Um, it's, a, it's a great book. Um, it goes through different cultures. It has, uh, I'm just opening the book here. I think there's probably been uh, 50 different countries in the book. And what this book does, so first of all, I don't get any royalties. I'm not here selling you the book. I know you can get this on Amazon and other places. I don't know what it costs. Uh, so it's, it's 60, it's more than 60 countries that are in the book. But um, it's written by Terry Morrison and Wayne Conaway. This has helped me a lot. Uh, I have, this again, this is my second edition. My first edition, um, I had all the little notes in here because I can bring up any country in here uh, and I'm here, I have Hungary as a country. It will give me background on Hungary. It will give me background on the different religions that they may practice there. It will give me business etiquette. It will tell me um, what to do, how to address people, how to, um, uh, uh, do you shake hands? Do you shake hands? Because some cultures like to hug, some people like to shake hands. These days, we're not doing anything. But when we get back to this point, it gives you guidance on what to do. It also is a great book if you don't know what to buy as a closing gift. Uh, a lot of cultures, uh, I know uh, Cutco, Cutco has great products and I know Cutco, um, a lot of agents buy them and give them out as gifts. A lot of cultures you would not want to give a knife to because they look at as a knife as severing the relationship. So this is a, this is a great book. I recommend it. I don't buy it, it's up to you, but it has a lot of good, and it's easy to read. It's not like a textbook, it's very easy to read. Uh, here's another good book, Immigrants and Boomers. Uh, I, I know it's probably in, in um, paperback at this point, uh, Dowell Myers. It goes into how um, America's changing and how the baby boomers are moving onwards and outwards and how the immigrants are moving in. So it's an easy read also. I, again, highly recommend it just as some resource material for you. Um, let's talk about some active listening now, uh, which you have all been doing very patiently and I appreciate it and I appreciate the questions. So again, it's always, it's important if you don't understand or you think that you don't understand, it's good, it's good to paraphrase, ask those open-ended questions and pay attention to the person as well as the message. Don't just listen to what they're saying, but how are they saying it? And this is just a chart on active listening. And again, I'm going at the end, I'm going to, I will put it in the chat for everybody. So here's what's important is educate yourself on the potential pitfalls. Know who's in front of you, do your research. We have many valuable resources um, and always, always, always keep fair housing in the forefront. In no way, shape, or form am I saying you should treat these people differently because they're coming from different cultures. You need to treat everybody the same, right? We have our fair housing laws, we have our federal, we have our state, we have our local. This is not bypassing that. This is trying to help you educate yourselves and have an understanding that we're all not in the same, we're not all in the same box. We all have different beliefs. We all have different biases. And most importantly is listen. If you ask a question, let them answer, listen, because we can learn so much by listening to people. So there are mistakes. People will make mistakes. You will make mistakes. So even some major corp corporations uh, can make mistakes. So here's an example. I don't know this, if everybody knows what this is. This is a Chevy Nova from the 1970s, right? There's our Chevy Nova. Well, Chevy Nova back in the 1970s uh, took their car and sold it in Mexico. So the Chevy Nova, they went to Mexico. And although the company reported that the car sold very well, maybe they should have considered a different name when they moved this product to Mexico. Because in Spanish, no va means not going. Right? So if you have a car, so you have a Chevy Nova, you move it to a Spanish speaking country, and now when somebody goes to buy, why would I want to buy a car that doesn't go? So again, this is important with translations. 
Here's another example with GE. So General Electric, do you all remember the jingle, we bring good things to life? Okay, well that translates in Asia, brings your ancestors back from the dead. So parts of East Asia, if they see bring good things to life, this is how they're interpreting it, that, oh my goodness, they're gonna bring my ancestors back from the dead. So we have to be very careful um, and a lot of these, and these are two big corporations that made big mistakes if they were taking their products out of the country. So um, being a certified international property specialist, I always recommend these big companies should hire some of us because we can help them understand when things go out of the, out of the, move out of the country. So this is the importance of understanding cultures. English is one of the hardest languages for anybody to know and, and learn. We have, the, we have, for example, two, T-O, two, T-O-O, -O, and T two, T-W-O. When someone is, who's not English as the first language hears us speak, it gets confusing to them. So just understand that how things translate is going to be a big thing um, on, and how you, in your marketplace. So be careful of how you say it and what you say because it may get interpreted the wrong way. So marketing, let's talk about some marketing to help you move forward. Um, so these are questions that you should think about when looking at advertisements and promotional material. Um, what does your message say? Uh, does it exclude any potential prospects or group? Again, fair housing, you don't want to exclude anybody. Uh, does the ad describe the services of your firm? Um, and when placing advertisers, the basic rule is to be inclusive. Don't rely solely on either foreign language media or mainstream platforms. So if you have, and this happens a lot downstate, we have a lot of newspapers here that are different languages. If you're going to publish your advertisement in those papers, you want to make sure what you're saying translates properly. Uh, so here's some tips for a multicultural approach. Uh, learn as much as possible about the traditions and beliefs of your potential clients. It's going to help you. Again, we're not looking to stereotype, but if you have some background information in their culture, it's going to have, help you out with them. Uh, again, don't assume all cultures are alike. Uh, there's considerable diversity within each ethnic segment based on country of origin, language, and social and cultural adaptation to the United States. Someone who's Spanish speaking coming from Spain is going to be somebody that's going to be different than somebody Spanish speaking coming from Mexico or uh, from any South American countries. You're going to have to look at the culture, not just the language. And again, be careful on your translations, as we just pointed out. Contracts, make sure they are reviewed by a legal expert if you're going to give them something uh, that translated into their language. But here we have to do all contracts in English. As a side note, if you have a seller client moving out of the country uh, and you want to help them, you can research the cultures of their countries they're going to, but also know that any documents they're going to sign in say Costa Rica or in Mexico, is not going to be in English. It's going to be in their primary language. And be sensitive about cultural slurs, stereotypes, cliches, taboos, understand the culture nuances. We may not think that we're offending somebody, but we might be offending somebody. They may not look like us. They may not dress like us. Uh, they may have different family values, uh, but if they're coming to you and you wanna work with them, have an understanding. So if you wanna work with different cultures, uh, you're not gonna be the real estate of the world, understand your niche, your language, affinities. Uh, you may have some personal interests. You, want, you need to be authentic with this. Uh, we call this prospecting globally, have awareness opportunities in your marketplace. Again, I don't know your market, I know my market. I don't know if there's businesses coming in where people may be moving in from, where maybe people may be moving out to. So understand your market. And that's, where, that's why I started with your market up front. So understand your market, outreach to clients, customers, other real estate professionals. Uh, you wanna be the go-to person to share your expertise, demonstrate your pro professionalism, build your reputation, reputation as the source of the sauce and the business will follow. Um, 
Here is um, something I subscribe to. It's called The Economist. It comes weekly. You can get it digital or print. The Economist, I am not an economist, uh, but there are sections in here that I can read up on different things that are happening around the world. So if I have a client coming in from Asia or Europe, I can read up, I can pull these out and read up on these. Um, CIA.gov, this is a website that is our central intelligence agency. So CIA.gov, you can go, it's a resource material for you. You can pull up any countries in the world and the most recent information on those countries can be accessed here. So if you don't want to buy the kiss, bow, shake hands, you can get a lot of information uh, from the CIA.gov. The kiss, bow, shake hands gets more into, to me, the more personal touch though. Um, every year, I don't know if it's going to happen this year, but uh, the local boards downstate uh, have got, get together and they have a global summit at the Marriott Mar Marquis in Manhattan. I recommend if you want to learn more about international, global, multicultural, uh, go to some of these summits, go to the international conventions. Again, nothing's happening in 2020, but hopefully 2021. Uh, I have done not just business roundtables. I, I live in Huntington. Uh, I, uh, I'm not ashamed to say that I typically do not cook Monday through Friday. I am out eating in town. Uh, I am eating outside these days. And I have gotten to know all the business owners. The business owners I have gotten to know are multicultural. So we discuss different businesses. And I have done business with them. I have done business with their families. So it's good to get out and explore these other businesses because you don't know what could lead to a new client. Uh, networking systems, uh, these are just market information, prospect clients, reminders, maps. Um, again, you can get a lot of this on CIA.gov. Uh, travel, when we can get back to traveling uh, and you have a vacation plan, try to work some business into your travel. Let's say you're going out of the country. Why not take the step and take business cards, take some time out of your vacation and do some business. Um, as a side note, if you do that, you can write a portion of your trip off for business purposes. I can't tell you how much, I'm not your accountant, but again, if you wanna to get to know other cultures and maybe start dabbling and getting to know other realtor, real estate professionals from around the world, this is how you can reach out and do this. Uh, go on a trade mission. New York State Association of Realtors was supposed to have a trade mission again this year in Italy. Unfortunately, that's not happening. A lot of local boards do have uh, trade missions as well. And uh, this is a, just a list to let you know that a lot of U.S. citizens are leaving the United States and going to Panama, Mexico, Belize, India, Malaysia, Philippines, Costa Rica. Um, so they are retirement programs. The beautiful thing about Belize, their primary language is English. So it's very comfortable for someone selling here to retire outside the country and retire in a place like Belize. So that's for our US expatriates. And there are a lot of us, not us, me, there are a lot of them out there. Uh, here's some additional things you can do. Um, National Association of Realtors has a certification course. It's at home with diversity. Uh, it is offered uh, through the local boards. And I know there may have been difficulty uh, getting some of these things scheduled. Uh, so I'm not trying to bypass any local board, uh, but the National Association of Realtors is offering this course. It's a six hour course. Uh, and at the end, you get the certification at home with diversity. There's no further things that you need to do. Uh, and it goes into a lot of what we talked about here today, but it gets more in depth to that. So you can go to National Association of Realtors um, website and the course is 50% off till the end of the year. So there's a lot of courses being offered out there at great discounts. I highly recommend this one. It really gets into more of the nitty gritty with the different cultures out there. Uh, the other one, uh, and I'm not pushing this because I'm an instructor on it, but 
the CIPS, if you want to get a designation, the Certified International Property Specialist. Um, they have this Global Perspectives is a quarterly uh, newsletter that comes out that I just recently received my latest one that gives you more global perspectives and it gets into local, international and lifestyles in real estate. Uh, and here are some referral networks. National Association of Realtors is associated with 90 National Real Estate Association in more than 70 countries and that list keeps growing. Uh, the Certified International Property Specialist Network is 4,000 real estate professionals and that is growing as well. And then if any of you belong to an international franchise, you have your own networks that you can network with. Uh, again, when I speak cultural, I speak international, it's all, it's all, they're all tied into each other. Uh, quickly on the CIPS designation courses, uh, there are uh, two basic courses you have to take, your local markets, transaction tools, and then you need three elective courses. The at home with diversity can be elective course, but there's also courses, there's one on Europe, there's one Asia Pacific, and there's one on the Americas. Uh, from there, uh, or if you have taken any of these our, uh, courses, CRS or CCI, CCIM course, that can be substituted in there as well. And you need 100 points to de the designation. I am a CIPS, I had the 100 points. You don't need to speak a separate language to have any under, you know, to get this designation. And I'm not, again, I'm not pushing certifications. I'm not pushing designations. I am a believer in education. And that's why I brought this forward because we are speaking about cultures. Uh, so with that, I think we are just shy of 2.30, but this is me saying thank you to all of you in a million different languages. <laughs>